Section 23 of Light Science for Leisure Hours. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Light Science for Leisure Hours by Richard A. Proctor. The Topographical Survey of India. At the close of the war with Tipu Sahib, Major Lambden planned the triangulation of the country lying between Madras and the Malabar coast, a district which had been roughly surveyed during the progress of the war by Colonel Mackenzie. The Duke of Wellington gave his approval to the project, and his brother, the Governor-General of India, and Lord Clive, son of the great Clive, Governor of Madras, used their influence to aid Major Lambden in carrying out his design. The only astronomical instrument made use of by the first survey party was one of Ramsden's zenith sectors, which Lord McCartney had placed in the hands of Dinwiddie, the astronomer, for sale. A steel chain, which had been sent with Lord McCartney's embassy to the Emperor of China and refused, was the only apparatus available for measuring. Thus began the great trigonometrical survey of India, a work whose importance it is hardly possible to overestimate. Conducted successively by Colonel Lambden, Sir George Everest, Sir Andrew Waugh, and Lieutenant Colonel Walker, the present superintendent, the trigonometrical survey has been prosecuted with a skill and accuracy which renders it fairly comparable with the best work of European surveyors. But, to complete in this style the survey of the whole of India would be the work of several centuries. The trigonometrical survey of Great Britain and Ireland has been already more than a century in progress and is still unfinished. It can therefore be imagined that the survey of India, nearly ten times the size of the British Isles, and presenting difficulties a hundredfold greater than those which the surveyor in England has to encounter, is not a work which can be quickly completed. But the growing demands of the public service have rendered it imperatively necessary that India should be rapidly and completely surveyed. This necessity led to the commencement of the Topographical Survey of India, a work which has been pushed forward at a surprising rate during the past few years. My readers may form some idea of the energy with which the survey is in progress, from the fact that Colonel Thuillier's report for the season 1866-67 to 67 announces the charting of an area half as large as Scotland, and the preparatory triangulation of an additional area nearly half as large as England. In a period of thirty years, with but few surveying parties at first, and a slow increase in their number, an area of 160,000 square miles has been completed and mapped by the topographical department. The revenue surveyors have also supplied good maps on a similar scale of 364,000 square miles of country during the 20 years ending in 1866. Combining these results, we have an area of 524,000 square miles or upwards of four times that of Great Britain and Ireland. For all this enormous area, the surveyors have the records in a methodical and systematic form, fit for incorporation in the Atlas of India. Nor does this estimate include the older revenue surveys of the northwestern provinces, which, for want of proper supervision in former years, were never regularly reduced. The records of these surveys were destroyed in the mutiny, chiefly in Hazambal and the Southwestern Frontier Agency. The whole of these districts remain to be gone over in a style very superior to that of the last survey. The extent of the country which has been charted may lead to the impression that the survey is little more than a hasty reconnaissance. This, however, is very far indeed from being the case. The preliminary triangulation, which is the basis of the topographical survey, is conducted with extreme care. In the present report, for instance, we find that the discrepancies between the common sides of the triangles, in other words, 
the discrepancies between the results obtained by different observers are in some cases less than one-tenth of an inch per mile in others they are from one inch to a foot per mile and in the survey of the kosya and garrow hills where observations had to be taken to large objects such as trees rocks etc with no defined points for guidance the results differ by as much as twenty six inches per mile these discrepancies must not only be regarded as insignificant in themselves but must appear yet more trifling when it is remembered that they are not cumulative inasmuch as the preliminary triangulation is itself dependent on the great trigonometrical survey let us understand clearly what are the various forms of survey which are or have been in progress in india there are three forms to be considered one the great trigonometrical surveys two the revenue surveys and three the topographical surveys great trigonometrical operations are extended in a straight course from one measured base to another every precaution which modern skill and science can suggest is taken in the measurement of each baseline and in the various processes by which the survey is extended from one baseline to the other the accuracy with which work of this sort is conducted may be estimated from the following instance during the progress of the ordnance survey of great britain and ireland a baseline nearly eight miles long was measured near lough foyle in ireland and another nearly seven miles long on salisbury plain trigonometrical operations were then extended from lough foyle to salisbury plain a distance of about three hundred forty miles and the salisbury baseline was calculated from the observations made over this long arc the difference between the measured and calculated values of the baseline was less than five inches as we have stated the trigonometrical survey of india will bear comparison with the best work of our surveyors in england a revenue survey is prosecuted for the definition of the boundaries of estates and properties the operations of such a survey are therefore carried on conformably to those boundaries the topographical survey of a country is defined by sir a scott waugh to imply the measurement and delineation of the natural features of a country and the works of man thereon with the object of producing a complete and sufficiently accurate map being free from the trammels of boundaries of properties the principal lines of operations must conform to the features of the country and objects to be surveyed the only safe basis for the topographical survey of a country is a system of accurate triangulation and where the extent of country to be surveyed is large there will always be a great risk of the accumulation of error in the triangulation itself which must therefore be made to depend on the accurate results obtained by the great trigonometrical operations in order to secure this result fixed stations are established in the vicinity of the great trigonometrical series where this plan cannot be adopted a network of large symmetrical triangles is thrown over the district to be surveyed or boundary series of triangles are carried along the outline of the district or along convenient internal lines the former of these methods is applicable to a hilly district the latter to a flat country when the district to be surveyed has been triangulated the work of filling in the topographical details is commenced each triangle being of moderate extent with sides from three to five miles in length and the angular points being determined as we have seen with great exactness it is evident that no considerable error can occur in filling in the details hence methods can be adopted in the final topographical work which would not be suitable for triangulation the triangles can either be measured up or the observer may traverse from trigonometrical point to point taking offsets and intersections or lastly 
he may make use of the plane table. The two first methods require little comment, but the principle of plane tabling enters so largely into Indian surveying that this notice would be incomplete without a brief account of this simple and beautiful method. The plane table is a flat board turning on a vertical pivot. It bears the chart on which the observer is planning the country. Suppose now that two points A and B are determined, and that we require to mark in the position of a third point C. It is clear that if we observed with a theodolite the angles A, B, C, and B, A, C, we might lay these down on the chart with a protractor, and so the position of C would be determined, with an accuracy proportioned to the care with which the observations were made and the corresponding constructions applied to the chart. But in plane tabling, a more direct plan is adopted. A ruler bearing sights, resembling those of a rifle, is so applied that the edge passing through the point A on the chart, the observer being situated at the real station A, passes through the point B on the chart, the line of sight passing through the real station B. The table, being fixed in the position thus obtained, the ruler is next directed so that its edge passes through A, while the line of sight points to C. A line is now ruled with a pencil through A towards C. In a similar manner, the table having been removed to the station B, a pencil line is drawn through the point B on the chart towards C. The two lines thus drawn determine by their intersection the place of C on the chart. The above is only one instance of the modes in which a plane table can be applied. There are several others. Usually the magnetic compass is employed to fix the position of the table in accordance with the true bearing of the cardinal points. Also, the bearings of several points are taken around each station, and thus a variety of tests of the correctness of the work become applicable. Into such details as these I need not here enter. It is sufficient that my readers should have been enabled to recognize the simple principles on which plane tabling depends, and the accuracy with which, when suitable precautions are taken, it can be applied as a method of observation subsidiary to the ordinary trigonometrical processes. A hilly country, says Sir A. Waugh, offers the fairest field for the practice of plane table surveys, and the more rugged the surface, the greater will be the relative advantages and facilities this system possesses over the methods of actual measurement. On the other hand, in flat lands, the plane table works at a disadvantage, while the traverse system is facilitated. Consequently, in such tracts, the relative economy of the two systems does not offer so great a contrast as in the former. In closely wooded or jungly tracts, all kinds of survey operations are prosecuted at a disadvantage, but in such localities, the commanding points must be previously cleared for trigonometrical operations, which facilitates the use of the table. In whatever way the topographical details have been filled in, a rigorous system of check must be applied to the work. The system adopted is that of running lines across ground that has been surveyed. This is done by the head of the party or by the chief assistant surveyor. A sufficient number of points are obtained in this way for comparison with the work of the detail surveyors. And when the discrepancies exceed certain limits, the work in which they appear is rejected. Owing to the extremely unhealthy, jungly, and rugged nature of the ground in which nearly all the Indian surveys have been progressing, it has not always been found practicable to check by regularly chained lines. There are, however, other modes of testing plane table surveys, and as these entail less labor and expense in hilly and jungly tracts, and are quite as effective if thoroughly carried out, they have been adopted generally, while the measured routes or check lines have only been pursued under more favorable conditions. Colonel Thuillier states that 
the inspection of the work of every detailed surveyor in the field has been rigorously enforced and the work of the field season is not considered satisfactory or complete unless this duty has been attended to the rules laid down to ensure accuracy in the survey are first that the greatest possible number of fixed points should be determined by regular triangulation secondly that the greatest possible number of plane table fixings should be made use of within each triangle and lastly that eye sketching should be reduced to a minimum if these rules are well attended to the surveyor can always rely on the value of the work performed by his subordinates but all these conditions cannot be secured in many parts of the ground allotted to the several topographical parties owing to the quantity of forest land and the extremely rugged nature of the country hence arises the necessity for test lines to verify the details or for some vigorous system of check and this is more especially the case where native assistants are employed so soon as the country has been accurately planned the configuration of the ground has to be sketched up this process is the end and aim of all the preceding work the first point attended to is the arterial system or water drainage constituting the outfall of the country whence are deduced the lines of greatest depression of the ground next the watersheds or ridges of hills are traced in giving the highest level lastly the minor or subordinate features are drawn in with the utmost precision attainable the outlines of tableland should be well defined says sir a waugh and ranges of hills portrayed with fidelity carefully representing the watersheds or divortia aquarum the spurs peaks depressions or saddles isthmuses or connecting links of separate ranges and other ramifications the depressed points and isthmuses are particularly valuable as being either the sites of ordinary passes or points which new roads should conform to and here we must draw a distinction between survey and reconnaissance it is absolutely necessary in making a survey that the outlines of ground as defined by ridges watercourses and feet of hills should be rigorously fixed by actual observation and careful measurement in reconnoitering more is trusted to the eye the scale of the indian topographical survey is that of one inch per mile the scale of half an inch per mile being only resorted to in very densely wooded or jungly country containing a few inhabitants and little cultivated or where the climate is so dangerous that it is desirable to accelerate the progress of the survey on the scale of one inch per mile the practiced draftsman can survey about five square miles of average country per day in intricate ground intersected by ravines or covered by hills of irregular formation the work proceeds much more slowly on the other hand in open and nearly level country or where the hills have simple outlines the work will cost less and proceed more rapidly on the scale of one inch per mile all natural features such as ravines or watercourses more than a quarter of a mile in length can be clearly represented villages towns and cities can be shown with their principal streets and roads and the outlines of fortifications the general figure and extent of cultivated waste and forest lands can be delineated with more or less precision according to their extent irrigated rice lands should be distinctly indicated since they generally exhibit the contour of the ground the relative heights of hills and depths of valleys should be determined during the course of a topographical survey these vertical elements of a survey can be ascertained by trigonometrical or by barometrical observations or by a combination of both methods the barometer says sir a waugh is more especially useful for determining the level of low spots from which the principal trigonometrical stations are invisible 
in using this instrument however in combination with the other operations the relative differences of heights are to be considered the quantities sought so that all the results may be referable to the original trigonometrical station the height above the sea level of all points coming under any of the following heads is especially to be determined for the purpose of illustrating the physical relief of the country first the peaks and highest points of ranges second all obligatory points required for engineering works such as roads drainage and irrigation viz the highest points or necks of valleys the lowest depressions or passes in ranges the junctions of rivers and debouchement of rivers from ranges the height of inundation level at moderate intervals of about three miles apart third principal towns or places of note of the various methods employed to indicate the steepness of slope that of eye contouring seems alone to merit special comment in true contouring regular horizontal lines at fixed vertical intervals are traced over a country and plotted on to the maps this is an expensive and tedious process whereas eye contouring is easy light and effective on this system all that is necessary is that the surveyor should consider what routes persons moving horizontally would pursue he draws lines on his chart approximating as closely as possible to these imaginary lines it is evident that when lines are thus drawn for different vertical elevations the resulting shading will be dark or light according as the slope is steep or gentle this method of shading affords scope as well for surveying skill as for draftsmanship from once a week may one eighteen sixty nine end of section twenty three recording by linda johnson Section number 24 of Light Science for Leisure Hours. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 6090, California, United States of America. Light Science for Leisure Hours by Richard A. Proctor. Chapter 24 A Ship Attacked by Swordfish. I have always been puzzled to imagine how the nine and twenty knights of fame, described in the lay of the last minstrel, managed to drink the red wine through the helmet bard. But in nature we meet with animals who seem almost as inconveniently armed as those chosen knights, who quitted not by their armor bright, neither by day nor yet by night. Amongst such animals, the swordfish may be recognized as one of the most uncomfortably armed creatures in existence. The shark has to turn on his back before he can eat, and the attitude scarcely seems suggestive of a comfortable meal. But the swordfish can hardly even, by that arrangement, get his awkwardly projecting snout out of the way. Yet doubtless this feature, which seems so inconvenient, is of great value to Xiphias in some way as yet unknown it enables him to get his living whether he first kills some of his neighbors with his instrument and then eats him at his leisure or whether he plunges it deep into the larger sort of fish and attaching himself to them in this way sucks nutriment from them while they are yet alive is not known to naturalists certainly he is fond of attacking whales but this may result not so much from gastronomic tastes as from a natural antipathy envy perhaps at their superior bulk unfortunately for himself xiphus though cold-blooded seems a somewhat warm-tempered animal and when he is angered he makes a bull like rush upon his foe without always examining with due care whether he is likely to take anything by his motion and when he happens to select for attack a stalwart ship and to plunge his horny beak through thirteen or fourteen inches of planking with perhaps a stout copper sheathing outside it he is apt to find some difficulty in retreating the affair usually ends by his leaving his sword embedded in the side of the ship 
in fact no instance has ever been recorded of a swordfish recovering his weapon if i may use the expression after making a lunge of this sort last wednesday the court of common pleas rather a strange place by the by for inquiring into the natural history of fishes was engaged for several hours in trying to determine under what circumstances a swordfish might be able to escape scot-free after thrusting his snout into the side of a ship the gallant dreadnought thoroughly repaired and classed a one at lloyd's had been insured for a three thousand lira against all the risks of the seas she sailed on march tenth eighteen sixty four from colombo for london three days later the crew while fishing hooked a swordfish cypheus however broke the line and a few moments after leaped half out of the water with the object it would seem of taking a look at his persecutor the dreadnought probably he satisfied himself that the enemy was some abnormally large ketakin which it was his natural duty to attack forthwith but this as it may the attack was made and at four o'clock the next morning the captain was awakened with the unwelcome intelligence that the ship had sprung a leak she was taken back to colombo and thence to Koken, where she was hove down near the keel was found a round hole an inch in diameter running completely through the copper sheathing and planking as the tax by swordfish are included among sea risks the insurance company was willing to pay the damages claimed by the owners of the ship if only it could be proved that the hole had really been made by a swordfish no instance had ever been recorded in which a swordfish had been able to withdraw his sword after attacking a ship a defence was founded on the possibility that the hole had been made in some other way professor owen and mr frank buckland gave their evidence but neither of them could state quite positively whether a swordfish which had passed its beak through three inches of stout planking could withdraw without loss of its sword mr buckland said that the fish had no power of backing and expressed his belief that he could hold a swordfish by the beak but then he admitted that the fish had considerable lateral power and might so wriggle its sword out of a hole and so the insurance company will have to pay nearly six hundred pounds because an ill-tempered fish objected to being hooked and took its revenge by running full tilt against the copper sheathing and oak planking from the daily news december eleventh eighteen sixty eight end of section number twenty four Section 25 of Light Science for Leisure Hours. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Light Science for Leisure Hours by Richard A. Proctor. The Safety Lamp. From the Daily News, December 4, 1868. As recent colliery explosions have attracted a considerable amount of attention to the principle of the safety lamp, and questions have arisen respecting the extent of the immunity which the action of this lamp secures to the miner, it may be well for me briefly to point out the true qualities of the lamp. In the Davy lamp, a common oil light is surrounded by a cylinder of wire gauze. When the air around the lamp is pure, the flame burns as usual and the only effect of the gauze is somewhat to diminish the amount of light given out by the lamp but as soon as the air becomes loaded with the carbureted hydrogen gas generated in the coal strata a change takes place the flame grows larger and less luminous the reason of the change is this the flame is no longer fed by the oxygen of the air but is surrounded by an atmosphere which is partly inflammable and the inflammable part of the gas so fast as it passes within the wire cylinder is ignited and burns within the gauze thus the light now given out by the lamp is no longer that of the comparatively brilliant oil flame but is the light resulting from the combustion of carbureted hydrogen or fire damp as it is called and every student of chemistry is aware that the flame of this gas has very little illuminating power so soon as the miner sees the flame thus enlarged and altered in appearance he should retire 
but it is not true that explosion would necessarily follow if he did not do so the danger is great because the flame within the lamp is in direct contact with the gauze and if there is any defect in the wire-work the heat may make for itself an opening which though small would yet suffice to enable the flame within the lamp to ignite the gas outside so long however as the wire gauze continues perfect even though it become red-hot there will be no explosion no authority is required to establish this point which has been proved again and again by experiment but i quote professor tyndall's words on the subject to remove some doubts which have been entertained on the matter although a continuous explosive atmosphere he says may extend from the air outside through the meshes of the gauze to the flame within ignition is not propagated across the gauze the lamp may be filled with an almost lightless flame still explosion does not occur a defect in the gauze the destruction of the wire at any point by oxidation hastened by the flame playing against it would cause an explosion and so on it need hardly be said however that imprudent as miners have often been no miner would remain where his lamp burned with the enlarged flame indicative of the presence of fire damp the lamp should also be at once extinguished but here we touch on a danger which undoubtedly exists and so far as has yet been seen cannot be guarded against by any amount of caution supposing the miner sought to extinguish the lamp by blowing it out an explosion would almost certainly ensue since the flame can be forced mechanically through the meshes though it will not pass through them when it is burning in the ordinary way now of course no miner who had been properly instructed in the use of the safety lamp would commit such a mistake as this but it happens unfortunately that sometimes the fire damp itself forces the flame of the lamp through the meshes the gas frequently issues with great force from cavities in the coal in which it has been pent up when the pick of the miner breaks an opening for it in these circumstances an explosion is inevitable if the issuing stream of gas happen to be directed full upon the lamp fortunately however this is a contingency which does not often arise it is one of those risks of coal mining which seem absolutely unavoidable by any amount of care or caution it would be well if it were only such risks as these that the miners had to face another peculiarity sometimes noticed when there is a discharge of fire damp is worth mentioning it happens occasionally that the light will be put out owing to the absolute exclusion of air from the lamp this however can only happen when the gas issues in so large a volume that the atmosphere of the pit becomes irrespirable with the exception of the one risk which we have pointed out above the davy lamp may be said to be absolutely safe it is necessary however that caution and intelligence should be exhibited in its use on this point professor tyndall remarks that unfortunately the requisite intelligence is not often possessed nor the requisite caution exercised by the miner and the consequence is that even with the safety lamp explosions still occur and he suggests that it would be well to exhibit to the miner in a series of experiments the properties of the valuable instrument which has been devised for his security mere advice will not enforce caution he says but let the miner have the physical image of what he is to expect clearly and vividly before his mind and he will find it a restraining and monitory influence long after the effect of cautioning words has passed away a few words on the history of the invention may be acceptable early in the present century a series of terrible catastrophes in coal mines had excited the sympathy of enlightened and humane persons throughout the country in the year eighteen thirteen a society was formed at sunderland to prevent accidents in coal mines 
or at least to diminish their frequency, and prizes were offered for the discovery of new methods of lighting and ventilating mines. Dr. William Reed Clanny, of Bishop Wearmouth, presented to this society a lamp which burnt without explosion, in an atmosphere heavily loaded with fire-damp, for which invention the Society of Arts awarded him a gold medal. The Rev. Dr. Gray called the attention of Sir Humphrey Davy to the subject, and that eminent chemist visited the coal mines in 1815, with the object of determining what form of lamp would best be suited to meet the requirements of the coal miners. He invented two forms of lamp before discovering the principle on which the present safety lamps are constructed. This principle, the property, namely, that flame will not pass through small apertures, had been, we believe, discovered by Stevenson, the celebrated engineer, some time before, and a somewhat angry controversy took place respecting Davy's claim to the honor of having invented the safety lamp. It seems admitted, however, by universal consent, that Davy's discovery of the property above referred to was made independently, and also that he was the first to suggest the idea of using wire gauze in place of perforated tin. In comparing the present frequency of colliery explosions with what took place before the invention of the safety lamp, we must take into consideration the enormous increase in the coal trade since the introduction of steam machinery. The number of miners now engaged in our coal mines is far in excess of the number employed at the beginning of the present century. Thus, accidents in the present day are at once more common, on account of the increased rapidity with which the mines are worked, and when they occur, there are more sufferers, so that the frequency of colliery explosions in the opening years of the present century, and the number of deaths resulting from them, are in reality much more significant than they seem to be at first sight. But even independently of this consideration, the record of the colliery accidents which took place at that time is sufficiently startling. Seventy-two persons were killed in the colliery at North Biddick at the commencement of the present century. Two explosions in 1805 at Hepburn and Oxclose left no less than 43 widows and 151 children unprovided for. In 1808, 90 persons were killed in a coal pit at Lumley. On May 24, 1812, 91 persons were killed by an explosion at Felling Colliery near Gateshead, and many more such accidents might readily be enumerated. From the Daily News, December 4, 1868, end of Section 25. Section 26 of Light Science for Leisure Hours. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Clive Catterall. Light Science for Leisure Hours by Richard A. Proctor. The Dust We Have to Breathe. A microscopist, Mr. Dancer, F.R.A.S., has been examining the dust of our cities. The results are not pleasing. We had always recognised city dust as a nuisance, and had supposed that it derived the peculiar grittiness and flintiness of its structure from the constant macadamising of city roads. But it now appears that the effects produced by dust, when, as is usual, it finds its way to our eyes, our nostrils, and our throats, are as nothing compared with the mischief it is calculated to produce in a more subtle manner. In every specimen examined by Mr. Dancer, animal life was abundant. But the amount of molecular activity, such is the euphemism under which what is exceedingly disagreeable to contemplate is spoken about, is variable according to the height at which the dust is collected and of all heights which these molecular wretches could select for the display of their activity, the height of five feet is that which has been found to be the favourite. Just at the average height of the foot-passenger's mouth, these moving organisms are always waiting to be devoured and to make us ill. 
and this is not all. As if animal abominations were insufficient, a large proportion of vegetable matter also disports itself in the light dust of our streets. The observations show that in thoroughfares where there are many animals engaged in the traffic, the greater part of the vegetable matter thus floating about consists of what has passed through the stomachs of animals, or has suffered decomposition in some way or other. This unpleasing matter, like the molecular activity, floats about at a height of five feet or thereabouts. After this, one begins to recognise the manner in which some diseases propagate themselves. What had been mysterious in the history of plagues and pestilences seems to receive at least a partial solution. Take cholera, for example. It has been shown by the clearest and most positive evidence that this disease is not propagated in any way save one, that is, by the actual swallowing of the cholera poison. In Professor Thudichum's masterly paper on the subject in the Monthly Microscopical Journal, it is stated that doctors have inhaled a full breathing from a person in the last stage of this terrible malady without any evil effects. Yet the minutest atom of the cholera poison received into the stomach will cause an attack of cholera. A small quantity of this matter drying on the floor of the patient's room, and afterwards caused to float about in the form of dust, would suffice to prostrate a houseful of people. We can understand, then, how matter might be flung into the streets, and after drying, its dust be wafted through a whole district, causing the death of hundreds. One of the lessons to be learned from these interesting researches of Mr. Dancer is clearly this, that the watering cart should be regarded as one of the most important of our hygienic institutions. Supplemented by careful scavenging, it might be effective in dispossessing many a terrible malady which now holds sway from time to time over our towns. From the Daily News, March the 6th, 1869 End of section 26section 27 of light science for leisure hours this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer visit librivox.org recording by clive catterall light science for leisure hours by richard a proctor photographic ghosts On the outskirts of the ever-widening circle lighted up by science, there is always a borderland wherein superstition holds sway. The arts and sciences may drive away the vulgar hobgoblin of darker days, but they bring with them new sources of illusion. The ghosts of old could only gibber. The spirits of our day can read and write and play on diverse musical instruments and quote Shakespeare and Milton. It is not, therefore, altogether surprising to learn that they can take photographs also. You go to have your photograph taken, we will suppose, desiring only to see your own features depicted on the cart, and lo, the spirits have been at work, and a photographic phantom makes its appearance beside you. It is true this phantom is of a hazy and dubious aspect. The dull mechanic ghost is indistinct, and may be taken for any one. Still, it is not difficult for the eye of fancy to trace in it the lineaments of some departed friend, who, it is to be assumed, has come to be photographed along with you. In fact, photography, according to the spiritualist, resembles what Byron called the lighting of the mind, which out of things familiar, undesigned, when least we deem of such, calls up to view the spectres whom no exorcism can bind. The phenomena of spiritual photography were first observed some years since, and a set of cart photographs were sent from America to Dr. Walker of Edinburgh, in which photographic phantoms were very obviously, however indistinctly, discernible. More recently an English photographer noticed a yet stranger circumstance, though he was too sensible to seek for a supernatural interpretation of it. When he took a photograph with a particular lens, 
there could be seen not only the usual portrait of the sitter, but at some little distance a faint double, exactly resembling the principal image. Superstitious minds might find this result even more distressing than the phantom of photographic friend. To be visited by the departed through the medium of a lens is at least not more unpleasing than to hold converse with spirits through an ordinary wrapping medium. But the appearance of a double, or fetch, has ever been held by the learned in ghostly lore to signify approaching death. Fortunately, both one and the other appearance can be very easily accounted for without calling in the aid of the supernatural. At a recent meeting of the Photographical Society, it was shown that an image may often be so deeply impressed upon the glass that the subsequent cleaning of the plate, even with strong acids, will not completely remove the picture. When the plate is used for receiving another picture, the original image makes its reappearance and as it is too faint to be recognisable, a highly susceptible imagination may readily transform it into the image of a departed friend. The double is generated by the well-known property of double refraction, obtained by a lens under certain circumstances of unequal pressure, or sometimes by inequalities in the process of annealing. So vanish two ghosts which might have been more or less troublesome to those who are ready to see the supernatural in commonplace phenomena. Will the time ever come when no more such phantoms will remain to be exorcised? From the Daily News, March the 2nd, 1869 End of section 27section 28 of Light Science for Leisure Hours This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This is a recording by Joanne Crosby. Light Science for Leisure Hours by Richard A. Proctor The Oxford and Cambridge Rowing Styles Whatever opinion we may have of the result of the approaching contest, 1869, there can be no doubt that this year, as in former years, there is a striking dissimilarity between the rowing styles of the dark blue and the light blue oarsmen. This dissimilarity makes itself obvious whether we compare the two boats as seen from the side or in the line of sight is directly along the length of either. Perhaps it is the latter aspect that an unpracticed eye will most readily detect the difference I am speaking of. Watch the Cambridge boat approaching you from some distance, or receding, and you will notice, in the rise and fall of the oars, as so seen, the following peculiarities. A long stay of the oar in the water, a quick rise from and return to the water, the oars remaining out of the water for the briefest possible interval of time. In the case of the Oxford boat, quite a different appearance is presented. There is a short stay in the water, a sharp rise from it and return to it, and between these the oars appear to hang over the water for a perceptible interval. It is, however, when the boats are seen from the side that the meaning of these peculiarities is detected, and also that the fundamental distinction between the two styles is made apparent to the experienced eye. In a Cambridge boat, we recognize the long stroke and lightning feather. Inculcated in the old trustees on rowing, in the Oxford boat, we see these conditions reversed, and in their place the waiting feather and lightning stroke. By the waiting feather, I do not refer to what is commonly understood by slow feathering, but to a momentary pause, scarcely to be detected when the crew is rowing hard, before the simultaneous dash of the oars upon the first grip of the stroke, and observing more closely, which by the way is no easy matter, as either boat dashes swiftly past we detect the distinct peculiarities of work by which the two styles are severely arrived at. In the Cambridge crew, we see the first part of the stroke done with the shoulders, precisely according to the old-fashioned models. The arm straight and the body has fallen back to an almost upright position. Then comes the sharp drop back of the shoulders beyond the perpendicular of the arms, simultaneously doing their work. So that as the swing back is finished, the back of the hands just touch the ribs in feathering. 
All these things are quite in accordance with what used to be considered the perfection of rowing. And indeed, this style of rowing has some important good qualities and a very handsome appearance. The lightning feather also, which follows the long sweeping stroke, is theoretically perfect. Now, in the case of the Oxford crew, we observe a style which at first sight seems less excellent. As soon as the oars are dashed down and catch their first hold of the water, the arms as well as the shoulders of each oarsman are at work. The result is that when the back has reached an upright position, the arms have already reached the chest and the stroke is finished. Thus the Oxford stroke takes a perceptibly shorter time than the Cambridge stroke. It is also, necessarily, somewhat shorter in the water. One would therefore say it must be less effective. Especially would an unpracticed observer form this opinion, because the Oxford stroke seems to be much shorter in range than it is in reality. There we have the secret of its efficiency. It is actually as long as the Cambridge stroke, but is taken in a perceptibly shorter time. What does this mean but that the oar is taken more sharply and therefore much more effectively through the water? Much more effectively so far as the actual conditions of the contest are concerned. The modern racing outrigger requires a sharp impulse because it will take almost any speed we can apply to it. It will also retain that speed between the strokes, a consideration of great importance. The old-fashioned racing aids required to be continually under propulsion. The lightning feather was a necessity in this case, for between every stroke the boat would lag terribly with a slow feathering crew. I do not say, of course, that the speed of a light outrigged craft does not diminish between the strokes. Anyone who has watched a closely contested bumping race and noticed the way in which its sharply cut bow of the pursuing boat draws up to the rudder of the other as by a succession of impulses, although either boat seen alone would seem to sweep on with almost uniform speed, will know that the motion of the lightest boat is not strictly uniform. But there is an immense difference between the almost imperceptible loss of way of a modern eight and the dead lag in the old-fashioned craft. And hence, we get the following important consideration. Whereas with the old boats, it was useless for a crew to attempt to give a very quick motion to their boat by a sharp, sudden lift, this plan is calculated to be, of all others, the most effective with the modern racing eight. It may be seen at first sight that, after all, the result of the Cambridge style should be as effective as that of the other. If arms and shoulders do their work in both crews with equal energy, which we may assume to be the case, and if the number of strokes per minute is equal, the actual propulsion energy ought to be equal likewise. A little consideration will show that this is a fallacy. If two men pull at a weight together, they will move it further with a given expenditure of energy than if the first one and then the other apply his strength to the work. And what is more to the purpose, they will be able to move it faster. So shoulders and arms working simultaneously will give a greater propulsion power than when working separately, even though in the latter case each works with its fullest energy. And not only so, but the simultaneous use of arms and shoulders, that sharpness of motion can alone be given, which is essential to the propulsion of a modern racing boat. I have said that the two crews are severely rowing in the style which has lately been peculiar to their respective universities. But the Cambridge crew is rowing in that form of the Cambridge style which brings it nearest to the requirement of modern racing. The faults of the style are subdued, so to speak, and its best qualities brought out effectively. In one or two of the long series of defeats lately sustained by Cambridge, the reverse has been the case. At present, too, there is a certain roughness about the Oxford crew, which encourages the hopes of the light blue supporters. But it must be admitted that this roughness is rather apparent than real, great as it seems, and it will doubtless disappear before the day of encounter. I venture to predict that the time of the approaching race, taken in conjunction with the state of the tide, will show that the present crews to be at least equal to the average. End of section 28
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Light Science for Leisure Hours by Richard A. Proctor. Betting on Horse Races, or The State of the Odds. There appears every day in the newspapers an account of the betting on the principal forthcoming races. The betting on such races as the Two Thousand Guineas, the Derby, and the Oaks often begins more than a year before the races are run, and during the interval the odds laid against the different horses engaged in them vary repeatedly, in accordance with the reported progress of the animals in their training, or with what is learned respecting the intentions of their owners. Many who do not bet themselves find an interest in watching the varying fortunes of the horses which are held by the initiated to be leading favorites, or to fall into the second rank, or merely to have an outside chance of success. It is amusing to notice, too, how frequently the final state of the odds is falsified by the event, how some rank outsider will run into the first place while the leading favorites are not even placed it is in reality a simple matter to understand the betting on races or contests of any kind yet it is astonishing how seldom those who do not actually bet upon races have any inkling of the meaning of those mysterious columns which indicate the opinion of the betting world respecting the probable results of approaching contests, equine or otherwise. Let us take a few simple cases of odds to begin with, and, having mastered the elements of our subject, proceed to see how cases of greater complexity are to be dealt with. Suppose the newspapers inform us that the betting is two to one against a certain horse for such and such a race. What inference are we to deduce? To learn this, let us conceive a case in which the true odds against a certain event are as two to one. Suppose there are three balls in a bag, one being white, the others black. Then, if we draw a ball at random, it is clear that we are twice as likely to draw a black as to draw a white ball. This is technically expressed by saying that the odds are two to one against drawing a white ball, or two to one on, that is, in favor of, drawing a black ball. This being understood, it follows that, when the odds are said to be two to one against a certain horse, we are to infer that, in the opinion of those who have studied the performance of the horse, and compared it with that of the other horses engaged in the race, his chance of winning is equivalent to the chance of drawing one particular ball out of a bag of three balls. Observe how this result is obtained. The odds are two to one, and the chance of the horse is as that of drawing one ball out of a bag of three, three being the sum of the two numbers two and one. This is the method followed in all such cases. Thus, if the odds against a horse are seven to one, we infer that the cognoscenti consider his chance equal to that of drawing one particular ball out of a bag of eight. A similar treatment applies when the odds are not given as so many to one. Thus, if the odds against a horse are as five to two, we infer that the horse's chance is equal to that of drawing a white ball out of a bag containing five black and two white balls, or seven in all. We must notice also that the number of balls may be increased to any extent, provided the proportion between the total number and the number of a specified color remains unchanged. Thus, if the odds are five to one against a horse, his chance is assumed to be equivalent to that of drawing one white ball out of a bag containing six balls, only one of which is white, or to that of drawing a white ball out of a bag containing sixty balls, of which ten are white, and so on. This is a very important principle, as we shall now see. Suppose there are two horses, amongst others, 
engaged in a race and that the odds are two to one against one and four to one against the other what are the odds that one of the two horses will win the race this case will doubtless remind my readers of an amusing sketch by leach called if i remember rightly signs of the commission three or four undergraduates are at a wine discussing matters equine one propounds to his neighbor the following question i say charlie if the odds are two to one against rataplan and four to one against quick march what's the betting about the pair don't know i'm sure replies charlie but i'll give you six to one against them the absurdity of the reply is of course very obvious we see at once that the odds cannot be heavier against a pair of horses than against either singly still there are many who would not find it easy to give a correct reply to the question what has been said above however will enable us at once to determine the just odds in this or any similar case thus the odds against one horse being two to one his chance of winning is equal to that of drawing one white ball out of a bag of three one only of which is white in like manner the chance of the second horse is equal to that of drawing one white ball out of a bag of five one only of which is white now we have to find a number which is a multiple of both the numbers three and five fifteen is such a number the chance of the first horse modified according to the principle explained above is equal to that of drawing a white ball out of a bag of fifteen of which five are white in like manner the chance of the second is equal to that of drawing a white ball out of a bag of fifteen of which three are white therefore the chance that one of the two will win is equal to that of drawing a white ball out of a bag of fifteen balls of which eight five added to three are white there remain seven black balls and therefore the odds are eight to seven on the pair to impress the method of treating such cases on the mind of the reader let us take the betting about three horses say three to one seven to two and nine to one against the three horses respectively then their respective chances are equal to the chance of drawing one one white ball out of four one only of which is white two a white ball out of nine of which two only are white and three one white ball out of ten one only of which is white the least number which contains four nine and ten is one hundred eighty and the above chances modified according to the principle explained above become equal to the chance of drawing a white ball out of a bag containing one hundred eighty balls when forty five forty and eighteen respectively are white therefore the chance that one of the three will win is equal to that of drawing a white ball out of a bag containing one hundred eighty balls of which one hundred and three the sum of forty five forty and eighteen are white therefore the odds are one hundred and three to seventy seven on the three one does not hear in practice of such odds as one hundred three to seventy seven but betting men whether or not they apply just principles of computation to such questions is unknown to me manage to run very near the truth for instance in such a case as the above the odds on the three would probably be given as four to three that is instead of one hundred three to seventy seven or four hundred twelve to three hundred eight the published odds would be equivalent to four hundred twelve to three hundred nine and here a certain nicety in betting has to be mentioned in running the eye down the list of odds one will often meet such expressions as ten to one against a horse offered or ten to one wanted now the odds of ten to one taken may be understood to imply that the horse's chance is equivalent to that of drawing a certain ball out of a bag of eleven 
but if the odds are offered and not taken we cannot infer this the offering of the odds implies that the horse's chance is not better than that above mentioned but the fact that they are not taken implies that the horse's chance is not so good if no higher odds are offered against the horse we may infer that his chance is very little worse than that mentioned above similarly if the odds of ten to one are asked for we infer that the horse's chance is not worse than that of drawing one ball out of eleven if the odds are not obtained we infer that his chance is better and if no lower odds are asked for we infer that his chance is very little better thus there might be three horses a b and c against whom the nominal odds were ten to one and yet these horses might not be equally good favorites because the odds might not be taken or might be asked for in vain we might accordingly find three such horses arranged thus odds a ten to one wanted b ten to one taken c ten to one offered or these different stages might mark the upward or downward progress of the same horse in the betting in fact there are yet more delicate gradations marked by such expressions respecting certain odds as offered freely offered offered and taken meaning that some offers only have been accepted taken taken and wanted wanted and so on as an illustration of some of the principles i have been considering let us take from the day's paper the state of the odds respecting the two thousand guineas it is presented in the following form two thousand guineas seven to two against rosicrucian offered six to one against pace offered seven to one wanted ten to one against green sleeve offered one hundred to seven against blue gown offered one hundred eighty to eighty against sir j hawley's lot taken this table is interpreted thus betters are willing to lay the same odds against rosicrucian as would be the true mathematical odds against drawing a white ball out of a bag containing two white and seven black balls but no one is willing to back the horse at this rate on the other hand higher odds are not offered against him hence it is presumable that his chance is somewhat less than that above indicated again betters are willing to lay the same odds against pace as might fairly be laid against drawing one white ball out of a bag of seven one only of which is white but backers of the horse consider that they ought to get the same odds as might be fairly laid against drawing the white ball when an additional black ball had been put into the bag as respects green sleeve and blue gown betters are willing to lay the odds which there would be respectively against drawing a white ball out of a bag containing one eleven balls one only of which is white and two one hundred and seven balls seven only of which are white now the three horses rosicrucian green sleeve and blue gown all belong to sir joseph hawley so that the odds about the three are referred to in the last statement of the list just given and since none of the offers against the three horses have been taken we may expect the odds actually taken about sir joseph hawley's lot to be more favorable than those obtained by summing up the three former in the manner we have already examined it will be found that the resulting odds offered against sir j hawley's lot estimated in this way should be as nearly as possible one hundred thirty two to eighty we find however that the odds taken are one hundred eighty to eighty hence we learn that the offers against some or all of the three horses are considerably short of what backers require or else 
that some person has been induced to offer far heavier odds against sir j hawley's lot than are justified by the fair odds against his horses severally i have heard it asked why a horse is said to be a favorite though the odds may be against him this is very easily explained let us take as an illustration the case of a race in which four horses are engaged to run if all these horses had an equal chance of winning it is very clear that the case would correspond to that of a bag containing four balls of different colors since in this case we should have an equal chance of drawing a ball of any assigned color now the odds against drawing a particular ball would clearly be three to one this then should be the betting against each of the three horses if any one of the horses has less odds offered against him he is a favorite there may be more than one of the four horses thus distinguished and in that case the horse against which the least odds are offered is the first favorite let us suppose there are two favorites and that the odds against the leading favorite are three to two those against the other two to one and those against the best non-favorite four to one and let us compare the chances of the four horses i have not named any odds against the fourth because if the odds against all the horses but one are given the just odds against that one are determinable as we shall see immediately the chance of the leading favorite corresponds to the chance of drawing a ball out of a bag in which are three black and two white balls five in all that of the next to the chance of drawing a ball out of a bag in which are two black and one white ball three in all that of the third to the chance of drawing a ball out of a bag in which are four black balls and one white one five in all we take then the least number containing both five and three that is fifteen and then the number of white balls corresponding to the chances of the three horses are respectively six five and three or fourteen in all leaving only one to represent the chance of the fourth horse against which the odds are therefore fourteen to one hence the chances of the four horses are respectively as the numbers six five three and one i have spoken above of the published odds the statements made in the daily papers commonly refer to wagers actually made and therefore the uninitiated might suppose that everyone who tried would be able to obtain the same odds this is not the case the wagers which are laid between practiced betting men afford very little indication of the prices which would be forced so to speak upon an inexperienced better bookmakers that is men who make a series of bets upon several or all of the horses engaged in a race naturally seek to give less favorable terms than the known chances of the different horses engaged would suffice to warrant as they cannot offer such terms to the initiated they offer them and in general success fully to the inexperienced it is often said that a man may so lay his wagers about a race as to make sure of gaining money whichever horse wins the race this is not strictly the case it is of course possible to make sure of winning if the better can only get persons to lay or take the odds he requires to the amount he requires but this is precisely the problem which would remain insoluble if all betters were equally experienced suppose for instance that there are three horses engaged in a race with equal chances of success it is readily shown that the odds are two to one against each but if a bettor can get a person to take even betting against the first horse a a second person to do the like about the second horse b and a third to do the like about the third horse c and if all these bets are made to the same amount say one thousand then inasmuch as only one horse can win the better loses one thousand on that horse say a and gains the same sum on each of the two horses b and c 
thus on the whole he gains one thousand the sum laid out against each horse if the layer of the odds had laid the true odds to the same amount on each horse he would neither have gained nor lost suppose for instance that he laid one thousand to five hundred against each horse and a won then he would have to pay one thousand to the backer of a and to receive five hundred from each of the backers of b and c in like manner a person who had backed each horse to the same extent would neither lose nor gain by the event nor would a backer or layer who had wagered different sums necessarily gain or lose by the race he would gain or lose according to the event this will at once be seen on trial let us next take the case of horses with unequal prospects of success for instance take the case of the four horses considered above against which the odds were respectively three to two two to one four to one and fourteen to one here suppose the same sum laid against each and for convenience let this sum be eighty four because eighty four contains the numbers three two four and fourteen the layer of the odds wagers eighty four to fifty six against the leading favorite eighty four to forty two against the second horse eighty four to twenty one against the third and eighty four to six against the fourth whichever horse wins the layer has to pay eighty four but if the favorite wins he receives only forty two on one horse twenty one on another and six on the third that is sixty nine in all so that he loses fifteen if the second horse wins he has to receive fifty six twenty one and six or eighty three in all so that he loses one if the third horse wins he receives fifty six forty two and six or one hundred four in all and thus gains twenty and lastly if the fourth horse wins he has to receive fifty six forty two and twenty one or one hundred nineteen in all so that he gains thirty five he clearly risks much less than he has a chance however small of gaining it is also clear that in all such cases the worst event for the layer of the odds is that the favorite should win accordingly as professional bookmakers are nearly always layers of odds one often finds the success of a favorite spoken of in the papers as a great blow for the bookmakers while the success of a rank outsider will be described as a misfortune to backers but there is another circumstance which tends to make the success of a favorite a blow to layers of the odds and vice versa in the case we have supposed the money actually pending about the four horses that is the sum of the amount laid for and against them was one hundred forty as respects the favorite one twenty six as respects the second one hundred five as respects the third and ninety as respects the fourth but as a matter of fact the amounts pending about the favorites bear always a much greater proportion than the above to the amounts pending about outsiders it is easy to see the effect of this suppose for instance that instead of the sums eighty four to fifty six eighty four to forty two eighty four to twenty one and eighty four to six a bookmaker has laid eighty four hundred to fifty six hundred eight hundred forty to four twenty eighty four to twenty one and fourteen to one respectively then it will easily be seen that he would lose seven thousand nine fifty eight by the success of the favorite whereas he would gain four thousand seven eighty two by the success of the second horse five thousand nine hundred thirty seven by that of the third and six thousand twenty seven by that of the fourth i have taken this as an extreme case as a general rule there is not so great a disparity as has been here assumed between the sums pending on favorites and outsiders finally it may be asked whether 
in the case of horses having unequal chances it is possible that wagers can be so proportioned just odds being given and taken that as in the former case a person backing or laying against all the four shall neither gain nor lose it is so all that is necessary is that the sum actually pending about each horse shall be the same thus in the preceding case if the wagers nine to six ten to five twelve to three and fourteen to one are either laid or taken by the same person he will neither gain nor lose by the event whatever it may be and therefore if unfair odds are laid or taken about all the horses in such a manner that the amounts pending on the several horses are equal or nearly so the unfair better must win by the result say for instance that instead of the above odds he lays eight to six nine to five eleven to three and thirteen to one against the four horses respectively it will be found that he must win one or if he takes the odds eighteen to eleven twenty to nine twenty four to five and twenty eight to one the just odds being eighteen to twelve twenty to ten twenty four to six and twenty eight to two respectively he will win one by the race so that by giving or taking such odds to a sufficiently great amount a better would be certain of pocketing a large sum whatever the event of a given race might be in every instance a man who bets on a race must risk his money unless he can succeed in taking unfair advantages over those with whom he bets my readers will conceive how small must be the chance that an unpractised better will gain anything but dearly bought experience by speculating on horse races i would recommend those who are tempted to hold another opinion to follow the plan suggested by thackeray in a similar case to take a good look at professional and practised betting men and to decide which of those men they are most likely to get the better of in turf transactions from chambers journal july eighteen sixty nine end of section twenty nine recording by linda johnson section thirty of light science for leisure hours this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Yearsley. Light Science for Leisure Hours by Richard A. Proctor. Squaring the Circle. There must be a singular charm about insoluble problems, since there are never wanting persons who are willing to attack them i doubt not that at this moment there are persons who are devoting their energies to squaring the circle in the full belief that important advantages will accrue to science and possibly a considerable pecuniary profit to themselves if they could succeed in solving it quite recently applications have been made to the paris academy of sciences to ascertain what was the amount which that body was authorized to pay over to any one who should square the circle so seriously indeed was the secretary annoyed by applications of this sort that it was found necessary to announce in the daily journals that not only was the academy not authorized to pay any sum at all but that it had determined never to give the least attention to those who fancied they had mastered the famous problem it is a singular circumstance that people have even attacked the problem without knowing exactly what its nature is one ingenious workman to whom the difficulty had been propounded actually set to work to invent an arrangement for measuring the circumference of the circle and was perfectly satisfied that he had thus solved a problem which had mastered all the mathematicians of ancient and modern times that we may not fall into a similar error let us clearly understand what it is that is required for the solution of the problem of squaring the circle to begin with we must note that the term squaring the circle is rather a misnomer because the true problem to be solved is the determination of the length of a circle's circumference 
when the diameter is known of course the solution of this problem or as it is termed the rectification of the circle involves the solution of the other or the quadrature of the circle but it is well to keep the simpler issue before us many have supposed that there exists some exact relation between the circumference and the diameter of the circle and that the problem to be solved is the determination of this relation suppose for example that the approximate relation discovered by archimedes note, who found that if a circle's diameter is represented by seven the circumference may be almost exactly represented by twenty-two end note, were strictly correct and that archimedes had proved it to be so then according to this view he would have solved the great problem and it is to determine a relation of some such sort that many persons have set themselves now undoubtedly if any relation of this sort could be established the problem would be solved but as a matter of fact no such relation exists and the solution of the problem does not require that there should be any relation of the sort for example we do not look on the determination of the diagonal of a square whose side is known as an insoluble or as otherwise than a very simple problem yet in this case no exact relation exists we cannot possibly express both the side and the diagonal of a square in whole numbers no matter what unit of measurement we adopt or to put the matter in another way we cannot possibly divide both the side and the diagonal into equal parts which shall be the same along each no matter how small we take the parts if we divide the side into one thousand parts there will be one thousand four hundred and fourteen such parts and a piece over in the diagonal if we divide the side into ten thousand parts there will be fourteen thousand one hundred and forty two and still a little piece over in the diagonal and so on for ever similarly the mere fact that no exact relation exists between the diameter and the circumference of a circle is no bar whatever to the solution of the great problem before leaving this part of the subject however i may mention a relation which is very easily remembered and is very nearly exact much more so at any rate than that of archimedes write down the numbers one hundred and thirteen three hundred and fifty five that is the first three odd numbers each repeated twice over then separate the six numbers into two sets of three thus one one three stroke three five five and proceed with the division thus indicated the result three point one four one five nine two nine dot 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 expresses the circumference of a circle whose diameter is one correctly to the sixth decimal place the true relation being three point one four one five nine two six five again many people imagine that mathematicians are still in a state of uncertainty as to the relation which exists between the circumference and the diameter of the circle if this were so scientific societies might well hold out a reward to anyone who could enlighten them for the determination of this relation with satisfactory exactitude may be held to lie at the foundation of the whole of our modern system of mathematics i need hardly say that no doubt whatever rests on the matter a hundred different methods are known to mathematicians by which the circumference may be calculated from the diameter with any required degree of exactness here is a simple one for example take any number of the fractions formed by putting one as a numerator over the successive odd numbers add together the alternate ones beginning with the first which of course is unity add together the remainder subtract the second sum from the first the remainder will express the circumference the diameter being taken as unity to any required degree of exactness we have merely to take enough fractions the process would of course be a very laborious one if great exactness were required and as a matter of fact mathematicians have made use of much more convenient methods for determining the required relation but the method is strictly exact the largest circle we have much to do with 
in scientific questions is the earth's equator as a matter of curiosity we may inquire what the circumference of the earth's orbit is but as we are far from being sure of the exact length of the radius of that orbit that is of the earth's distance from the sun it is clear that we do not need a very exact relation between the circumference and the diameter in dealing with that enormous circle confining ourselves therefore to the circle of the earth's equator let us see what exactness we seem to require we will suppose for a moment that it is possible to measure round the earth's equator without losing count of a single yard and that we want to gather from our estimate what the diameter of this great circle may be this seems indeed the only use to which in this case we can put our knowledge of the relationship we are dealing with we have then a circle some twenty five thousand miles round and each mile contains one thousand seven hundred and sixty yards or in all there are some forty four million yards in the circumference and therefore roughly some fourteen million yards in the diameter of this great circle hence if our relation is correct within a fourteen millionth part of the diameter or a forty four millionth part of the circumference we are safe from any error exceeding a yard all we want then is that the number expressing the circumference the diameter being unity should be true to the eighth decimal place as quoted above but as i have said mathematicians have not been content with a computation of this sort they have calculated the number not to the eighth but to the six hundred and twentieth decimal place now if we remember that each new decimal makes the result ten times more exact we shall begin to see what a waste of time there has been in this tremendous calculation we all remember the story of the horse which had twenty-four nails in its shoes and was valued at the sum obtained by adding together a farthing for the first nail a halfpenny for the next a penny for the next and so on doubling twenty-four times the result was counted by thousands of pounds the old miser who paid at a similar rate for a grave eighteen feet deep doubling for each foot killed himself when he heard the total but now consider the effect of multiplying by ten six hundred and twenty times a fraction with that enormous number for denominator and unity for numerator expresses the minuteness of the error which would result if the long value of the circumference were made use of let an illustration show the force of this it has been estimated that light which could eight times circle the earth in a second takes fifty thousand years in reaching us from the faintest stars seen in lord ross's giant reflector suppose we knew the exact length of the tremendous line which extends from the earth to such a star and wanted for some inconceivable purpose to know the length of the circumference of a circle of which that line was the radius the value deduced from the above-mentioned calculation of the relation between the circumference and the diameter would differ from the truth by a length which would be imperceptible under the most powerful microscope ever yet constructed nay the result we have conceived enormous as it is might be increased a millionfold or a million times a millionfold with the same result and the area of the circle formed with this increased radius would be determinable with so much accuracy that the error if presented in the form of a minute square would be utterly imperceptible under a microscope a million times more powerful than the best ever yet constructed by man not only has the length of the circumference been calculated once in this unnecessarily exact manner but a second calculator has gone over the work independently the two results are of course identical figure for figure it will be asked then what is the problem about which so great a work has been made the problem is in fact utterly insignificant its only interest lies in the fact that it is insoluble a property which it shares along with many other problems 
as the trisection of an angle, the duplication of a cube, and so on. The problem is simply this. Having given the diameter of a circle to determine by a geometrical construction in which only straight lines and circles shall be made use of, the side of a square equal in area to the circle. As I have said, the problem is solved if by a construction of the kind described we can determine the length of the circumference, because then the rectangle under half this length and the radius is equal in area to the circle, and it is a simple problem to describe a square equal to a given rectangle. To illustrate the kind of construction required, I give an approximate solution, which is remarkably simple, and, so far as I am aware, not generally known. Describe a square about the given circle, touching it at the ends of two diameters, AOB, COB, at right angles to each other and join c a let c o a e be one of the quarters of the circumscribing square and from e draw e g cutting off from a o a fourth part a g of its length and from a c the portion a h then three sides of the circumscribing square together with a h are very nearly equal to the circumference of the circle the difference is so small that in a circle two feet in diameter it would be less than the two hundredth part of an inch. If this construction were exact, the great problem would have been solved. One point, however, must be noted. The circle is, of all curved lines, the easiest to draw by mechanical means. But there are others which can be so drawn, and if such curves as these be admitted as available, the problem of the quadrature of the circle can be readily solved. There is a curve, for instance, invented by Dinostratus, which can readily be described mechanically, and has been called the quadratrix of Dinostratus, because it has the property of thus solving the problem we are dealing with. As such curves can be described with quite as much accuracy as the circle, for, be it remembered, an absolutely perfect circle has never yet been drawn, we see that it is only the limitations which geometers have themselves invented that give this problem its difficulty. Its solution has, as I have said, no value, and no mathematician would ever think of wasting a moment over the problem, for this reason, simply that it has long since been demonstrated to be insoluble by simple geometrical methods so that when a man says he has squared the circle and many will say so if one will only give them a hearing he shows that either he wholly misunderstands the nature of the problem or that his ignorance of mathematics has led him to mistake a faulty for a true solution end of section thirty